I found out what happened? I puked. I cried. I was in total denial of what happened. I couldn't understand. From telling juries to not believe their confessions, to blaming a wife, to tales of masked killers, we break down five of some of the weakest defenses we have seen in our criminal trials. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Sometimes we don't think about it, but defending a criminal case is no easy task. Think about it. You have the resources of the government up against you. You have a client accused of some terrible things and sometimes just a mountain of evidence to try to poke holes in. But I am a legal analyst. I am an attorney. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention those times in our cases when the defense maybe didn't have the strongest arguments. So I want to break down five of arguably the weakest defenses we have seen in our criminal trials. And I want to start with Richard Merritt, the 49-year-old disgraced attorney who was accused of stabbing his mother to death with a kitchen knife. Now, authorities said that Merritt killed his mother, 77-year-old Shirley Merritt, on the day he was supposed to report to prison for unrelated financial crimes, essentially stealing money from his clients. He was set to begin a 15-year prison sentence. So Merritt allegedly stabbed his mother multiple times in the back and face as she was cooking his last meal before being locked up. Think about that. And now to give you an idea of this, the force of the stabbings was so intense that the handle of the knife broke off. And that's not all. Investigators also found a 35-pound dumbbell that they say he used to beat his mom's head with. Immediately after the murder, Merritt took off to Tennessee, where he lived under a new alias. He got a job at a bar. He started online dating, met a new girlfriend. But eight months later, U.S. Marshals came a-knocking, and they arrested Mr. Merritt. So he's on trial a few months ago, this past year, and he says he's innocent. And this is where his defense comes in. He says he didn't kill his mother, but he was there when she was killed. Oh, yes. The defense was that while his mom was cooking for him on that day, he heard a knock on the door. So I went to the front door, and I opened it. And there were two individuals there, two men, and they both were pointing pistols at me. And they told me to let them in. So what'd you do? I let them in. They said, head to the basement and don't say an effing word. And then what happened to your mother? It was the worst sound I've ever heard in my life. Um, she plunged headlong into the wall. It, it's a sound I can hear to this day as I'm sitting here. The gentleman who pushed her down the stairs, put his pistol behind his back into the, the back part of his jeans. He ran down the stairs, turned the corner, and came back with the 35 pounds weight that has been seen during the course of this trial. And where did the knife come from? Well, <laughs> the knife came later. Um, this monster took this dumbbell and proceeded to bludgeon my mother right in front of me. And then the older guy took off up the stairs. He came back a few minutes later with the kitchen knife and proceeded to stab my mother repeatedly in front of me. There's nothing I could do. I had a, a pistol to my back. I couldn't believe this was happening. I had no clue who these people were or why they were doing this to us. Ah, the classic two random strangers did it. That's basically what he argued for his defense, testified that after the men were finished with Shirley, one of them took out a cell phone, showed Richard pictures of his ex-wife, son, and daughter, and said, if you say a single word, they're next. And then he said, instead of calling police, he vanished. Well, on cross-examination, the prosecution pointed out holes in his story, which went along with their narrative that he's someone who consistently lied to people, and it worked took the jury less than an hour to convict Merritt on all counts, including malice and felony murder charges, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In a discussion of bad defenses, there's really no one more to blame for a bad defense than Darrell Brooks Jr. You remember this guy? The 40-year-old man who went on trial for driving his red SUV through a group of holiday parade goers out in Waukesha, Wisconsin back in 2021. 
It ended in the deaths of six people and injuries to dozens of others. Now, what was his defense? Well, that's where it gets a little tricky. So first, he decided to represent himself, which, I don't know, nine times out of ten is not a great decision for a defendant. Usually better to have trained legal counsel represent you. But he decided to do it, and his defense was bizarre. It was a combination of a few things. First, he tried to go with his seeming sovereign citizen defense, that the government doesn't have jurisdiction over him, and he questioned the witnesses' relationships with the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the defense would like to call the plaintiff state of Wisconsin to the stand. Your Honor, I object. The objection is noted. It is sustained. Call your next witness, please. Reason for the sustain? Not relevant. So is the state not present? Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to address that any further. I believe the jury deserves to know the, who the plaintiff is in his matter. That's that's very relevant to the case. How can they rule on something when they don't Mr. Really Brooks, know who the plaintiff is? Please move on. Do you even know the state of Wisconsin? Objection. Grounds. Grounds. Sustained. That didn't work. So then he tried to question exactly what the witnesses saw that day, but I saw directly through the driver's window. What did you see? I saw a man focused on the group ahead of him. Is that Daryl Brooks that you saw? Yes. Yeah, not only did witnesses testify to actually seeing him drive the car, but there was a blown up photo and video showing him in the driver's seat of the car. Then it seemed he tried to suggest, well, the driver was trying to avoid people and maybe even lost control of the car. Do you know why the vehicle was beeping its horn? I imagine that the driver was angry and wanted to get through the crowd. Do you know that for sure? You asked me my opinion. Yes, I, I, I did ask your opinion. Now I'm asking you, do you know for sure if the driver of the vehicle you observed was in fact angry? I assume that he was. You thought because of that sound, that there had to be some mechanical problems going on with the engine. I thought that there could be. The problem with that is that there's video of the car just straight up ramming into people and didn't stop. And there was no problem with the car. A state inspector testified that after reviewing the steering wheel, the tires, the brakes, the gas, there was no mechanical issue that would cause the driver to lose control. So then Darrell Brooks Jr., he tried to ask the jury just forget the law and the facts. You have the power to nullify any law that you don't agree with. Objection. Move to strike. Statement. Sustain. That is what we call jury nullification. It's basically asking the jury to decide the case based on some other reason other than what they're supposed to base it on. Totally improper. You can't ask them to do that. Well, in the end, the jury convicted Darrell Brooks Jr. of all 76 charges, including six counts of first-degree intentional homicide, and he was sentenced to multiple consecutive life terms of imprisonment without the possibility of parole. All right, let's go over now to Florida for the Anthony Tote case. So Tote, a 46-year-old physical therapist, was on trial for the brutal murders of his wife, 42-year-old Megan, and their three children four-year-old Zoe, 13-year-old Alec, and 11-year-old Tyler. He was even charged with killing the family dog, too. But here was the problem for Mr. Tote. Authorities found their decomposing bodies in the family home, and Tote was living there for weeks. They were serving him an arrest warrant for unrelated insurance fraud charges, and they caught him, and they find the bodies. So Tote sits down for an interview with investigators, and he admits that he killed his family as part of this pact with his wife, that they would all die and go to the other side to escape the apocalypse. These killings were a combination of stabbing, suffocating, and even drugging with Benadryl. But then she rolled and started squiggling, and I put my hand over her mouth, and then put a pillow over top of her. I stabbed him, and he started kicking was trying to get up, and I was able to get in and get the knife right in there. 
they got they got it. They start bleeding quite a bit. Now what happens? Meg wanted to go. Gave her the knife. And I laid next to her, and she put the knife into her stomach. So I said, "Why don't you take some more Benadryl? So at least you're not going to fight me, and I'll do it." It's pretty damning, right? But then before trial, he speaks with his sister on the phone from jail and says it was Megan who killed the kids and herself. And he just found them dead. And he doesn't know what he really said to investigators because he was stoned and he was out of it. And he doubles down on that defense at trial. Again, that Megan is the killer. I came home and my kids were dead. It was the most horrible day of my life. And what I mean more horrible is my wife died in front of me also. What could have prohibited Megan from killing your children? I have no idea. We woke up that morning, she was pain free. Everything was good. I didn't even see this coming. They say, you know, blindsided. This was a blindside by like a Mack truck with, filled with dynamite. But on cross-examination by the prosecution, he got a little testy. You told law enforcement that you were afraid he was going to get away, right? That's what Meg told me, yes. That's not my question. You told law enforcement oh, yeah. multiple the times video. that Tyler was fast and he was... You saw the video, away. and you saw the video also of saying, I said things that have been proven incorrect. That's not responsive to my question. Actually, it is. But yes or no. You didn't say yes or no, ma'am. Yes or no. Thank you. Did you tell law enforcement that you had to kill Tyler quickly because he was the fastest? That's what I told you law enforcement. That is correct. And I don't remember anything after I left the house till I got to jail. So I'm refuting, I'm, I'm going on your premise that that video is correct. Okay. Well, that is you in the video, right? It's a sickly version of me, yes. It's an emotionally and, disturbed video of me, yes. And that's you talking, right? That is me talking, that's correct. Okay. Thank so, God I didn't tell you I assassinated Kennedy. There's no question. Now look, blaming the victim who's dead, they can't speak for themselves. Sometimes that's a good defense. But here, maybe not so much. You see, for Mr. Tote, that defense really didn't make a whole lot of sense given everything else in this case. And the jury convicted him, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Talking about cases that really don't add up and some of the weaker defenses we have seen in our criminal trials, we want to go over now to Robert Durst. Wild case. So the real estate scion went to trial in 2021 for the murder of his best friend, Susan Berman. She'd been shot to death in her L.A. home back in 2000. And here's the problem for Mr. Durst. First, there was a motive. The evidence suggested that he killed his friend because he believed that she was going to talk to the police about what she knew regarding the disappearance of Durst's first wife, Kathy Durst, who vanished in 1982. So then he escapes to Texas to hide out. He actually ends up shooting and killing his neighbor, and he goes on trial. He gets acquitted. That's a story for another time. But back to Susan. The evidence also established that Susan wouldn't have let a stranger into her house that there was no signs of a break-in. And Durst was in California at the time of her killing. But this is about the defense, right? Well, listen to what he told the prosecutor during his interview after his arrest. You agree you did not just find Susan's body and somebody Come else killed her. You did not find Susan's body. Okay, he says he didn't find the body, right? Then at trial, his defense attorney admits that that is exactly what happened. Bob Durst did not kill Susan Berman, and he doesn't know who did. He did find her body. Shortly after someone had shot her in the back of the head. Yeah, he walks into her home, and he finds her dead. Okay. Then Durst, for years, claimed that he was not the one who wrote this chilling letter sent to the police with the word cadaver 
and Berman's address on it, basically alerting them to her body. To begin with, you didn't write the, write the cadaver note, is that right? You write the cadaver note. Whoever wrote that note had to be involved in Susan's death. And what's interesting about that is that there was evidence that his handwriting matched the cadaver note, but he denied it for years. You heard him say it. The only person who wrote that had to have been involved in the murder, right? Well, listen to his defense at trial. When Bob showed up and found her dead, he panicked. He wrote the anonymous letter so her body would be found, and he ran. So now, his defense is exactly the opposite of what he had been saying, okay? He wrote the note. And Durst, at 78 years old and in his very frail state, he was quite sick at the time, he gets on the stand and doubles down on all of this. Did you kill Susan Burma? No. Do you know who did? No, I do not. I shouted Susan a couple of times. Her eyes were closed. I put my hand over her face. I might have left that out to see if she was breathing, to see if I could feel breath and it felt cold. If somebody had done this to Susan, maybe he was still here. And I walked out the front door. I got to a pay phone around where sunset, just before getting to sunset. I picked up the phone, dialed 911. Then I was aware that my voice is very recognizable. So I decided Instead of calling 911, I would send the police a letter telling them that Susan was dead in her house. The problem, of course, is Durst is a liar. And why should the jury believe anything he has to say, right? Well, prosecutor John Lewin honed in on this. How many instances of perjury do you think you have committed during your testimony in this trial? I've lied about several times. So now you're saying that the killer was actually in the house when you were there? I believe the killer was either still in the house or in the yard when I arrived. Mr. Durst, haven't you testified that Susan's body was cold? I did not testify that Susan's body was cold. Play it. See if I can feel breath. And it felt cold. Well, what do you have to say about that? Her breath felt, her face felt cold. Her, she's dead. What do you mean her breath felt cold? Was she breathing on you when you got there? No, she was not breathing. So how can her breath be cold when she's dead? She's a stiff. Did you kill Susan Berman? No. But if you had, you would lie about it, correct? Correct. Not a great defense. Maybe a little too convenient that he just happened to stumble upon a dead body, right? Whether or not they should believe him with all this. No way connected to this whatsoever. Well, what do you think happened? He was convicted of the murder of Susan Berman, and he was sentenced to life in prison. But he actually died only a few months later in prison. For our last week defense, we want to go full circle. I started talking about the Merritt case and that unbelievable defense of two random people just storming into his mom's home and killing his mother. Well, we heard something very similar in the Christian Bahena Rivera trial. The 26-year-old, who was an undocumented immigrant, was accused of murdering 20-year-old University of Iowa student Molly Tibbetts after she disappeared during a run in July of 2018. Her body was found a month later, partially naked in a field, and she had been stabbed to death. Really sad crime. But the evidence against Rivera was quite strong. There was blood found in the trunk of his car that matched Tibbetts. There was surveillance footage showing his car driving where Tibbetts was running. And he even led investigators to her body and initially told them he killed her. 
but blacked out, doesn't remember what happened. Now, his attorneys argued that this confession was false, that it was a result of sleep deprivation and improper pressure from police. But at trial, he takes the stand and he speaks through a translator. He speaks Spanish. And he presents a radically new defense. In fact, a radically new story that Tibbetts was killed by strangers and he was the fall guy. After you took a shower, uh, what did you do? I left the bathroom. What did you see? With sweaters and their faces covered. The bigger one, I could see that he had a gun, and the smaller one, I could see that he had a knife. We got into our, to the car. They just told me to drive straight. Yes, one of them told the other one. One of them said to the other one something about someone running. When you followed that road, did you see anyone? Yes. Who did you see? A person jogging. Ever met Molly Tibbetts before? No. No. But now do you recognize or believe that person was Molly Tibbetts? That's right. One of them got out of the car. Which one? El de la parte enfrente. Uh, the one that was on the front. So the guy with the knife. Correct. Correct. What did he do? El solo empezó a ir en la hacia el, hacia enfrente, hacia la dirección del pueblo. Well, he just started uh, going towards uh, forward, towards the town direction. How long was he gone? Alrededor de 10, 12 minutos. Around uh, 10 uh, to 12 minutes. The guy in the back, was he doing anything? Cuando empezó a pasar el tiempo, él empezó a ponerse nervioso, a murmurar en la parte de atrás. Uh, well, when the time started going by, he started uh, kind of whispering in the back. Did you hear him say anything? Pues se escuchaban muchas cosas, pero lo único que pude entender, lo único que se pudo escuchar fue que él dijo, come on, ya. Yeah. Uh, well, um, you could hear a lot of things, uh, but uh, I guess what I heard him saying is, uh, come on, Jack. Do you know who either of the people were that were in that car with you? No. No? What happened next? Alrededor de los 12 minutos, la persona regresa de vuelta al carro. Well, around like 12 minutes after, that person comes back to the car. Piden que siga manejando. They asked me to continue driving. Were you directed to stop at some point? Sí. Yes. First, the person that was in front got out of the car, and then the person who was behind. What happened next? I've heard them opening the trunk. What happened next? Solamente sentí un movimiento en el carro y se volvió a cerrar la cajuela. I just heard a movement in the car, and then that the trunk closed. They asked me to turn around. Did you do that? Sí. Yes. What did they say next? Que continuaba manejando y me indica que vaya hacia la terracería. They asked me to continue driving and to go towards the gravel road. I got out of the car because I didn't have my keys. Obviamente sabía que había algo en la cajuela. Well, obviously, I knew there was something in the trunk. What did you see? Un cuerpo. A body. Was that the body of Molly Tibbetts? Sí. Yes. At that point in time, did it look like she was alive? Al principio miré como... Algún movimiento, pero después no miré ninguna, ningún tipo de movimiento. 
Well, at the beginning, I saw like a little bit of movement, but then after, there was no movement. Did she have injuries to her body? No, mire. I did not look. What did you do next? Estuve un par de minutos pensando que 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 el qué hacer, pero fue cuando decidí solo bajarla del carro. Well, I stayed there a couple of minutes thinking uh, what to do, and then I just uh, I decided to uh, take the body out. Why didn't you call the police, sir? Porque estaba asustado. Because I was scared. So here's the only issue with that story. There's really nothing backing that up. There's no evidence to support that these two masked men kidnapped him and forced him to do this. Again, how convenient for him with this story, right? Well, the jury didn't believe any of it. Bahena Rivera was convicted of the first-degree murder of Molly Tibbetts, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That's all we have for you here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.